Hello, I'm your host, Kyrie Douglas, and welcome to Catalyzing Computing, the official podcast of the Computing Community Consortium. The Computing Community Consortium, or CCC for short, is a programmatic committee of the Computing Research Association. The mission of the CCC is to catalyze the computing research community and enable the pursuit of innovative, high-impact research. This episode of Catalyzing Computing was recorded following the CCC's Thermodynamic Computing Workshop, which took place January 2019 in Honolulu, Hawaii. In this episode, I interview Workshop Organizing Committee member Nitesh Ganesh, a PhD student at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He was awarded the Best Paper Award at IEEE ICRC 17 for the paper, A Thermodynamic Treatment of Intelligent Systems. I also speak with Workshop Participant Gavin Crooks, formerly a senior scientist at Rigetti Quantum Computing, who developed algorithms for near-term quantum computers. This is the second episode on the Thermodynamic Computing Workshop. For more about the background and inspiration for this workshop, listen to my interview with workshop proposers Tom Conti and Todd Hilton and What is Thermodynamic Computing Part 1. Enjoy. So you're listening to the CCC podcast coming from Honolulu, Hawaii, where we just concluded the Thermodynamic Computing Workshop. Um, here with one of the participants and organizers, Nitesh Ganesh. Hi. Uh, thank, you. thank you for having me on the podcast. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, so, Nitesh, can you give a little bit about your background, how you got involved with the workshop? I am currently a PhD student at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, I have been working on non-equilibrium thermodynamics, uh, information theory, and Landauer limits to computing. And I happened to run into Todd Hilton, one of the other organizers, about like a year and a half ago, talking about uh, the intersection of these topics. And we kept talking and we felt like we had some ideas that were common where we thought there were a lot more that we could do from a thermodynamic perspective when it comes to computing. From there, uh, him and I worked out a lot of ideas together and I have been presenting on some of these topics, specifically the thermodynamic conditions as it relates to inference mm -hmm. and uh, learning at other uh, conferences. Him and Tom were uh, talking about putting together a workshop and they reached out to me because uh, I do have a certain sense of background in a lot of these intersecting topics. And yeah, that's that's how I got here. Can you talk a little bit about your research using thermodynamics for, for inference? How does that work? There's been a lot of work. It's hard to just cite a few authors, but uh, we did have a few people here. People like Suzanne Stoll, uh, David Wolpert, and Jim Crutchfield, all three of them were here. Uh, they had you know done work where they were interested in essentially the lower limits of dissipation uh, when it comes to learning, when mm -hmm. a system's learning or when a system's performing inference. Suzanne has done a lot of work, especially when it comes to predictive inference. So I was interested in the same topic and I had uh, taken some of their work and you know tried to apply it uh, to neural networks, for example. I was very interested in what are the lower limits to computation with respect to ne neural networks. I was also curious about adopting some of the recent results that I've obtained in these areas of non-equilibrium thermodynamics and try to explain uh, some of the general thermodynamic conditions and how they map onto specific learning algorithms. Okay. And I was trying to then ask the question, if instead of building systems that satisfy certain algorithms, can we build systems that satisfy certain thermodynamic conditions? And if we did that, then because these conditions and algorithms are equivalent, will we get the algorithms as a byproduct? Right that kind of gelled well with what Tom and Todd were also looking for. So um, I guess that's like more of my research. Okay. So the workshop was kind of divided up into breakout groups, um, three main areas, physical systems, model systems, and theory. Uh, you were one of the leaders of the theory group. Can you talk about what kind of conclusions came out of those breakouts? So it's very interesting because to put a little background in it, uh, even though I do do a lot of work in on equipment thermodynamics, I, I still feel like I'm more on the engineering side mm -hmm. of things and a lot of these people. So I was trying to like understand from their perspective. Uh, it was great to have Suzanne there uh, as a co-leader. And let me divide it into a couple of parts that we kind of realized. There's this huge history of people working on something called thermodynamics off computation. And for a lot of people, 
it, it was that area. They thought that you know thermodynamic computing was the same as thermodynamics of computation. Can you explain the difference between those two things? Um, thermodynamics of computation, we have a lot of these existing computing technologies, and a lot of them uh, do not take into account thermodynamic inefficiencies. Uh, there are a lot of thermodynamic costs that can be optimized in these existing technologies. For people in theory group, felt like for for the longest time maybe we didn't have the tools to do it now more and more we have the tools to apply these new ideas and remove those efficiencies across the stack in mm. existing technologies and that it in itself should provide a lot of energy benefits um, and that should reflect in one aspect of the final report but there were others which is where i stood I was more interested in asking the question, say, given a particular problem statement, some kind of problem that we want to solve, can we determine a set of thermodynamic conditions that is equal into that problem statement? And then starting all the way from like the material level, put together a system that solved the problem by satisfying those conditions. Okay. Uh, so they it, essentially, it, it could be thought of a little bit as like top down versus bottom up. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's going to be overlap certain aspects of it. So there were people who were interested in the theory group of, you know, working on those aspects of the theory and improving the tools to do the top-down part and improve the th uh, thermodynamics of computation. There were others who were uh, particularly interested in extending the theory that we have to improve the bottom-up part. For example, uh, Michael Dewey's, uh, who I was very really happy to meet, talked about how a particular system, for example, Gavin Kirks, uh, David Seaback, uh, other uh, great people in this area have figured out, say, given a particular initial state and final state, they had figured out how to, like, as an external uh, controller, can tweak the knob to go from A to B, the path to go from A to B, so that you, say, minimize dissipation or something, okay. some kind of optimal path. Uh, and Michael Davies was very interested in saying, you take that framework and then can you extend it and say, you have to go from A to B. Uh, you don't want to have any external person tweaking the knobs, but you set it up, set the whole system up in such a way that it'll go from A to B while optimizing something. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of what we wanted to do from that bottom-up perspective. So those are the kind of areas that people noted that needed to be solved. Right. And those have like wide implications in a lot of other cases outside of computing. But I think it you know gels really well with what this group wanted to go to do particularly and there were there was also detailed aspects of like wanting to improve for example Suzanne focused on asking the question if we really pushed ourselves to the thermodynamic limits uh, do new rules for information processing kind of come out of it mm -hmm. um, and you know some of these rules might already be existing rules which is great you know then we have done our job in those areas but there might be other rules that we didn't expect and you know gives us more ideas on how to compute okay do you have any examples of what kind of rules those would be? Um, I mean, n not exactly. I mean, if I, if I was like, say, venturing a guess or mm -hmm. something like that, um, I, I would think that if, if I had a system that was, and th this is kind of based on what uh, Suzanne has been working on and some of, the work, some of the work I've been working on, I would think that if you had some kind of like plastic system, self-organizing system that was, say, maintaining homeostasis, right? If it was maintained homeostasis in a very energy efficient manner, I would think that the only way for it to do it is to like kind of learn its environment and predict it. Right. So it, it tells me that like, you know, pushing it to the thermodynamic limit of efficiency in certain kind of systems produces the learning uh, inference aspect of the behavior. Mm -hmm. So that is one such rule. Uh, but I'm sure that there are like, uh, instead of not just focusing on the minimizing dissipation part, Non-equilibrium thermodynamics is much more richer and you can, you know, uh, characterize a lot of different behavior. So I wouldn't be surprised that we can like extend it and, you know, come up with all kinds of new learning rules. Okay. So I guess outside of your specific breakout group, what do you think was sort of the big conclusion to come out of the workshop um, that you think is going to be highlighted sort of in the report? I think what was really important uh, was they really pointed out that for something like this to succeed going forward, uh, we have to identify, uh, say, a class of problems that we have to be, be willing to show that these kind of ideas will be better than existing technologies. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think like that was important for me to like hear. And also, uh, I think that part and also talking about at the end of the day, you can build all these technologies, but you have to have a way to like properly interface with it. 
Uh, you need ways to like people, you know, different people might be able to access it and use it and do experiments and test it. So those kind of fundamental issues that need to be solved, having that clarified was, I think, was very useful. Yeah, I guess that's big because even if you have an abstract idea, logistically, you still have to have a system that anyone, well, not anyone, but someone trained could use and be successful with it. Right. Um, so I guess building off that, what do you think the impact of thermodynamic computing will be in the future? Like if you had to imagine a sort of moonshot 30 years from now, uh, what kind of application would, would a thermodynamic computer be doing? So I'm, I'm a little biased here. Um, I, I think like, I, like I said, this is where it helped having different people because Tom talked about randomized algorithms, which I thought was very interesting. I didn't particularly think about it when I was working on these ideas, mm. but I think it, that definitely should be a big part. But one the area that I'm specifically interested in, and I think these kind of ideas will really help, is in the area of uh, artificial intelligence. Um, I really do think that these kind of like thermodynamic constraints on, on biological systems as what produced specific kind of like learning and inference behavior uh, in biological systems. So especially in, you know, in the, in this current state of artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, we want, you know, these areas are really big now and we want to build intelligent systems and we want them to be energy efficient. And if it happens to be the case that pushing limits of thermodynamic efficiency gives us the learning as a byproduct, then, you know, we got both of you know best of both worlds there and in that sense that is the area that i'm most excited about um that is the area i mean that's my personal research so <laughs> like maybe i i maybe I, I am really biased but that that is the area that i think that we will really make a lot of headway into uh for example like areas like neuromorphic computing are going to provide like huge energy boosts right and like ideas of these ideas of thermodynamic computing are like extensions uh going past that and asking the question, can we like maximize these efficiencies everywhere? Uh, and Or maybe start from the efficiencies and go the other way around and get the learning. So I, I would see, and um, if you talk to Todd, maybe uh, he might have also mentioned this, uh, a lot of these areas which need like real-time learning, you know, in a dynamic environment, uh, something like a chip that you can stick into a robot or self-driving cars, uh, you need them to be both intelligent and efficient. Right. And I think like, and that's not even the start of it, right? There's all these IoT devices as well. So those are the areas that I think that, you know, thermodynamic computing can really provide a lot of benefit in uh, going forward. And I'm, I'm sure as we work our way through this, we'll, you know, you know, find out more and more specific areas yeah. where, you know, these ideas might provide a lot better, you know, might provide a more efficient solution uh, than existing classical computers. Yeah, that's definitely a big thing. Uh, kind of off topic, but speaking mm -hmm. of AI, uh, I know we're talking at dinner about self-driving cars mm -hmm. um, and the criteria you think for that to be successful. Can you talk a little bit about <laughs> that? Correct. Okay. And maybe, I don't know if that ties into thermodynamic computing at all. I, I, I don't know if it specifically ties into thermodynamic computing yet. Um, I mean, we're, we're still very early uh, to tie it into... Uh, you know, like you said, like in an ideal situation 30 years from now, I can say you know, maybe a thermodynamic chip, computing chip is what you need to like stick into a self-driving car mm -hmm. and it'll do the job for you. Uh, but self-driving cars in itself, uh, how do I put it? Yeah. I, I think how much, how far we have achieved is like great, mm -hmm. but this is more of an anecdote where I was talking about how I was recently in India, right? And people who drive there are like acrobats. They are like amazing. They make vehicles do all kinds of things to navigate with each other. And that I think is like amazing. And I, I kind of asked the question if, you know, if, if we can, to me at least, maybe I'm just like, you know, it's partly joking, partly true. Solving self-driving cars meant solving self-driving cars in India. Right. It felt like <laughs> if you can solve it in the hardest environment, then, you know, you should be able to solve it everywhere else. Uh, th that kind of like, you know, uh, maybe I'm thinking too far ahead, but you know, th that kind of like, that seemed like a weird criterion for me. Um, the other part, I guess, like I was curious about, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, there are any self-driving car people who are working on these things already and can like, you know, let me know. That'll be great. Like, um, it seemed to me that self-driving cars kind of like learn how to drive by kind of learning the rules of, of the road, uh, which is what it seems to me. And uh, but it feels like humans learn how to drive or 
drive by knowing how to break the rules, kind of, but you know, choosing not to do it Right. in terms of risk reward. So it seems that the, solving the latter problem is much harder than solving the even the earlier problem is extremely hard, but the latter problem is much harder than that. So if, it seems to me that maybe that's the way we need to do it. And I think that there is like starting to be work in that direction. So uh, will thermodynamic computing solve it? No idea. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, uh, it's, it, it's, it's an exciting time to even be talking about yeah. this. So I think that's great. Yeah. I mean, yeah, seems kind of unrelated, but it was an mm. interesting point. Maybe there's some way thermodynamics can overlap with that in terms of how uh, you assess risk, um, like within the system. Right. Yeah. I, I think that, that, that would be interesting. Uh, I, I think the part that thermodynamic computing can help there, at least to me from initially, is purely that if, if we could build much more efficient inference chips, right, just that is going to be huge. Because there is no way we can put in, you know, something with, say, uh, a set of, like, computing chips that take up about a kilowatt of power or something on a car uh, and have it run a self-driving car. Um, I don't know how that is viable. Right. But if thermodynamic computing allows us to create an inference chip much more efficient than anything else out there, then, you know, that is a start. But then again, like... Uh, I feel like to get into this real notion of like at what level, uh, you know, how, how much more idea, how much more thermodynamic computing chips can help the AI area uh, needs a lot of work because uh, I feel like I'm I'm going to go into a long rabbit hole here <laughs> a little bit, but I, I would be interested in understanding, uh, you know, if we if we say to really build some kind of like thermodynamic inference chip. We'll have to extract the uh, thermodynamic principles of intelligence uh, in existing systems. Like we, what we're really trying to do is kind of like build, kind of like a you know extract principles of intelligence from the brain and kind of like achieve it mm -hmm. in an ideal scenario. So if you're trying to extract the thermodynamic principles of intelligence from existing biological systems and then implement them in some kind of artificial system, um, it might be the case that the the complexity of human intelligence does not exist at the neural network level. Uh, there might be some intelligence at the neural network level, but the complexity might be more uh, existing in another, you know, either upper or lower level. And, you know, ideally, we would want thermodynamic conditions to extract that. So, you know, if we build thermodynamic computing based on these newer conditions of intelligence, that ne did not necessarily map onto a neural network, but it was, say, in the brain, it was neural network plus glial cells plus all kinds of stuff, right? Then suddenly, uh, it might be the case that purely from an you know intelligence performance perspective, thermodynamic computing might give you a better chip. Right. But I think, like, at this point, I, I simply do not know. And, like, which is why we need to, like, figure those questions out. Yeah. Because like in from the neuroscience community, there there's like continuous work coming on how we have, have we have all these like newer parts that contribute so much to our own intelligence, and at, and we want to and there is work from the AI and machine learning community to put in these new ideas into existing neural networks, and and that's what we want to do as well. So um, hopefully uh, it'll work out. Yeah, right. we'll see where it goes. Um, so I guess just logistically, how do you think the workshop? was organized and how uh, easy do you think that process was for other people that might be interested in holding a workshop or something like that? Um, I think it was great. I mean, thank you so much for all your help setting it all up. Sure. I also like, you know, the way we like split it into initially, we had these people who were linked in similar areas to work on work together. And then we like kind of like, uh, you know, randomized the groups. And that was great because I think uh, all these groups having different people uh, for coming from different areas of expertise, working together in a single group was really good for people to, you know, come in and say, oh, you know, these ideas have already been solved or this is an issue you really need to care about. So I, I really love that aspect of it. Uh, I've not been to a workshop where we like randomized mm -hmm. uh, groups like that. Okay. Um, it was also good in a workshop sense because... And maybe more people have been to work. I mean, I'm still a grad student, so I'm still <laughs> kind of like navigating yeah. uh, all these areas. But, you know, a lot of the people here were, were heroes of mine. So th that was great for me. Right. Uh, uh, maybe th maybe I was like, oh, this is my chance to see all my heroes uh, <laughs> uh, uh, in person. But I think like the part that I really liked was it was more focused on 
you know, groups and discussions rather than, you know, everyone coming in and just like giving what, what they're working on. So that, that was great. And finally, the last part, the writing, right? Because we were working towards, you know, starting off the report on the last day. I think that was really useful. Again, I haven't done workshops where we, we were going to write a report on the last day to start it off. Mm -hmm. So because we had like, you know, there was an end goal saying on the last day, we need to have a set of ideas and something on paper that we could translate onto a you know, beginning of a report. As someone who's writing his dissertation, I know it's very easy to like kind of like put it off. <laughs> like, oh, I'll write it later. I'll work right. on something else now. And it's even harder when there's like 40 people going in 40 different directions, getting everyone to like, again, kind of talk about what to write and how to write it. It's hard. And it was good that we started off here because I thought, I think what we have now, the skeleton of a report is in a pretty good shape to like, you know, kind of like mold it into something very useful going forward. Yeah, uh, there's definitely a lot of content that came out of this. Um, so it should be relatively easy, I guess, in the oh, grand scheme oh, of okay. things for the organizing committee to kind of turn that draft into a final. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. So, I mean, I'm, I completely enjoyed my experience. Like, I, I think like this was a great workshop. I like the format. And I was like telling Tom and Todd about, you know, you know, th maybe these are the kind of formats we need to like have in other workshops going forward, because I, I felt like I was exhausted at the end of every day, but it was a good kind of exhaustion. Right. Like I was like happy that like I really, you know, forced to like rethink everything through the day and then, you know, let's start all over again and do, go through the process. So that was great. Yeah. CCC workshops for anyone interested in attending one or proposing one. Um, definitely can be demanding because uh, really working all day, but also uh, very heavy on breakouts. Not a lot of time where people just talk at you. So there'll be information linked somewhere on the page that this is posted uh, if you want to learn more. Uh, any final thoughts, Natash? I realize that there's a lot of work to be done moving forward. But, you know, if, if you're a researcher, you want to be at the beginning of these things. Like you want to have a lot of work. I'm finishing up grad school, so I'm going to like balance just focusing on my own <laughs> dissertation while also like working on these reports. Uh, but I'm, I'm very excited. I think like going forward, we're going to see these kind of like more kind of these workshops, hopefully. Uh, and I think we have sparked interest in different people here to, to think about these ideas and be willing to introduce them to a wider community who are doing the same. So uh, yeah, let, uh, let's see, you know, if I'm maybe I'll, I'll be like back here in five years yeah. or something <laughs> uh, saying like, oh yeah, thermodynamic computing is great. You know, we're, we're having started. a good time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. Well, thank you for being here. Um, go enjoy Honolulu. <laughs> yeah, finally. <laughs> Listening to the CCC podcast here with Gavin Crooks right after the thermodynamic computing workshop. Uh, Gavin, how are you doing today? I'm great. A little tired. Yep. Uh, thanks for being here. So, could you tell me a little bit about your background? What interests you in coming to this workshop? I've worked uh, on um, non equilibrium thermodynamics for a long while, trying to understand the fundamental. Um, limits to thermodynamics, particularly when it comes to microscopic systems and information processing. So this workshop is uh, very relevant to those issues. Okay. And you're a chemist by training, is that correct? My PhD is in chemistry, yes. Although I tend to sort of cut across various areas. How did you get more into computing? Uh, into computing? Uh, I guess computers were always my original passion. Chemistry was kind of a side project. This sort of a return to home? No. Yeah, computers are fun. <laughs> All right. Um, so can you kind of summarize what the breakout groups that you participated in at the workshop talked about? Any conclusions that came out of those? Uh, that we, you know, we discussed what, what it really means to have a thermodynamic computer. Part of the process is trying to define that term more clearly. Uh, sort of two different ways of really thinking about that. One is uh, a computer that's operating at the limits of thermodynamics. And another is to think about a computer that is in some sense uh, using thermodynamic uh, principles to run an algorithm or to using thermodynamic principles to um, construct the computer rather than having to design it in some sense. Do you think either of those areas is more likely or more compelling, at least like personally? 
Likely, it depends on sort of time scale you're talking about. I think trying to build computers that are operating close to the firmament limits uh, in their processing is something that we can do now on a, uh, or, or beginning to be able to do now on a uh, proof of principle level. How far away we are from being able to do that on a practical level is is unknown, and that's why we we're getting together and, and talking through these issues to yeah. try to see where the technology might be uh, leading us and if we can sort of get ahead of that curve and develop uh, the fundamentals that we're going to need to understand computers operating at that level. In principle, we can have computers that, that, that use a tiny fraction of the energy to do the same computation compared to our computers today. But it's also very possible that these, these, these hypothetical computers they're not going to be necessarily sort of general purpose machines in the same way that our current laptop is. It'll be a specialized device. And part of the uh, issue we're facing is um, what are the sort of killer apps? What what would actually use these computers to, um, what problems would we actually right. attack with? The other side of it is sort of the more self-assembly. Um, can we instead of trying to have to design uh, a firmware computer. Conceptually, a, a computer at this scale could have a huge number of components in the same way we have a huge number of neurons in our head. And the neurons in our head are not pre-programmed exactly which neuron connects to which neuron. The sort of the overall architecture of the brain is obviously programmed at some level in our genes, but the individual connections are not uh, predetermined. So, you know, can you build uh, computers using that more sort of self-assembling um, kind of uh, paradigm? And, you know, that in principle is a really cool thing. Um, in practice, it's really hard to see how to do that. Right. So if you had to project like your wildest dream idea for a, a killer app um, using a thermodynamic computer in 30, 40 years, what would it be? It would be a... Um, a laptop sized device that could perform exascale calculations. So exascale is right at the limits of what um, current generation supercomputers can do. But instead of requiring a warehouse of computer hardware and an entire power plant to power the thing, you'd be able to do the same kind of calculations on um, a laptop sized device using a few tens of watts, about the energy expenditure of our own brain. And you might say, well, what on earth would I need to do that much calculation on my laptop for? And the answer is, I don't know. Uh, this has always been the case with computers that uh, it's been hard to predict what, um, given very large computational resources, what people actually put those resources to. So I don't know what we'll do exascale calculations on our laptops for, but I'm sure there will be amazing applications if we could do that. And that kind of energy budget... Uh, a few tens of watts uh, for an exascale calculation is sort of the reasonable limit that we can hope to achieve if all the physics and device uh, design actually comes together. Yeah, I guess that's a powerful thing. It's not too dissimilar to the fact that most cell phones are as powerful as a huge computer that would have taken up a room in the 40s or 50s. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's always the joke about uh, the IBM guy saying, well, 50 computers... That should be our that should be our worldwide market. We what would anybody need more computers <laughs> than that for? Or Bill Gates allegedly saying you only need six hundred forty k. Um, yeah, we as as we just keep finding new interesting things to do with all that computer resources. So, I guess do you have any research that you want to plug uh, outside of what we've talked about here today? Um, research to plug or just interesting projects you want to let people know about oh well i mean my current research i mean apart from thinking about um you know the thermodynamics of computation also thinking a lot these days about um quantum computers mm -hmm. there's a like quantum computers uh it's the same inspiration that we're running up against the limits of what um the conventional computer technology can do and in terms of uh, how fast it can go and how much energy it needs uh, quantum computers is another way around uh, that limitation by taking advantage again of physics um, and trying to uh, just find a whole new paradigm of how we do the calculations. Um, 
And it all connects together. So there's uh, aspects of thermodynamics that crop up in quantum computers also. Did you meet any people at this workshop um, that you hadn't met before that you might establish a potential collaboration with in the future? Um, collaboration? I don't really know. Collaboration, I don't know. Um, I know it's it's been one hour since the workshop. It's, it's been one hour. <laughs> but no, no, no. I mean, one of the nice things about um, uh, workshops and conferences and what have you is you actually meet people who you may know professionally from their papers. Um, you don't know necessarily um, personally. Right. Um, so I have met uh, Seth Lloyd, for example. I know his work very well. He knows my work. Uh, I met him once a long time ago when I was a grad student, which he won't remember. So, no, it's good to actually meet him in person. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of overlap in the things that we're thinking about. Right. Uh well, that's all the questions I have, so thank you for being here, and I hope you enjoyed the workshop. Okay, okay, thanks. That's it for this episode of Catalyzing Computing. To learn more about the Thermodynamic Computing Workshop, visit the workshop website under the Visioning Activities tab at coarayorg slash ccc. I'll be back soon with more interviews from members of the computing community, including University of Maryland iSchool Dean Keith Marzullo, and more Visioning Workshop recaps. If you've enjoyed the podcast, like, subscribe, and rate us five stars. Until next time, peace.